Okay, in this uh, section, we're going to talk about chapter eight, or begin chapter eight, dealing with hypothesis testing. Okay, so pretty much in this chapter, we're going to talk about some of the basic things that are related to hypothesis testing, and then we'll talk about how to test a claim about a population proportion, and then test a claim about a population mean. Okay, now in section 8.1, we're going to be dealing with the basics of hypothesis testing. Now, what I teach talk about in this video for this section is going to be relevant to the other videos that will be coming up in the future, like testing the claim about a proportion and testing the claim about a mean. And in this section, we're going to develop the ability to identify the null hypothesis, the null and alternative hypothesis, when given some claim about a population parameter, such as a proportion, mean, standard deviation, or variance. Also, we'll develop, develop the ability to calculate a test statistic, find critical values, calculate p-values, and state a final conclusion that addresses the original claim. Okay? So we're going to present the general components of a formal hypothesis test, okay? And these are the bullet points that we will focus on in this section. Identifying the null and alternative hypothesis from a given claim and express both in symbolic form. Calculate the value of the test statistic given a claim and sample data. Choose the sampling distribution that is relevant either find the p-value or identify the critical value or critical values, and then state the conclusion about a claim in simple, non-technical terms. So here's what we have here. All right, we'll start with definitions here. In statistics, a hypothesis is a claim or a statement about a property of a population. So you'll be given some type of claim or some type of statement that uh, deals with some type of population or we can say things like the proportion of students who uh, smoke is, let's say approximately 0.46. That would be a statement about some type of population, okay? That would be a hypothesis. Now, what we'll be doing is a hypothesis test or a test of significance. We're going to be using a procedure for testing the claim about a property of a population. So here in this case, you'll be given a procedure of how to test a certain hypothesis. And the rare event rule for inferential statistics is this. If under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is extremely extremely small, we can conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. All right, now this is the other part of inferential statistics. In the last chapter, chapter seven, we already talked about uh, another type of in inferential statistics, which was confidence intervals. The other type of inferential statistics is hypothesis testing. And on the next page, you'll see the flow chart for that hypothesis testing procedure. We start by identifying the claim, and then next you'll write in symbolic form the null and the alter, well, actually, you'll write the opposite of the original claim, okay? And then identify the null and alternative hypothesis. And then next you'll select your significance level, and then identify and uh, calculate the test statistic. And then this branches off into two parts. You're either going to do the p-value method or the critical value method. If you do the p-value method, you have to identify the p-value by drawing the normal curve. And then you might have to use technology as well. And then number seven, make the decision or whether to reject the null or fail to reject the null and then write your conclusion in non-technical terms. But if you use the critical value method, you'll just uh, identify the critical value from your level of significance. 
and the type of test you'll have. We'll go into more detail about that later and then make your decision whether to reject the null or fail to reject the null. Okay. Now, rarely we'll use the confidence interval method. Okay. You can start a confidence interval with the confidence level selected here in this table. And because a confidence interval estimate of a population parameter contains the likely values of that parameter, we can reject a claim that the population parameter has a value that is not included in the confidence interval. Okay, so if that uh, value is not in the confidence interval, then we can reject the claim. If it is in that confidence interval, if it is in that confidence interval range, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So let's break these steps down and explain them individually, and then we're going to do some examples of this, and then we'll put all this together at the end. Okay. Number one, steps one, two, and three. You're going to use the claim to create a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So in this case here, let's define the null and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is denoted by this notation H sub zero. H sub zero is the notation for the null hypothesis. This is a statement that the value of a population parameter is equal to some claimed value. And here we test the null hypothesis directly in the sense that we assume it is true that it is true and reach a conclusion to either reject it or fail to reject it. Okay, that's very important because the null hypothesis is gonna be the value of a, a statement where the value of a population parameter is equal to some claimed value. Now, the opposite of that is the alternative hypothesis. Now, we're going to use H1 as the null hypothesis. Some textbooks use H sub A or H with the capital letter A. This one is H with the lowercase a. But the alternative hypothesis, it is a statement that a parameter has a value that somehow differs from the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, the symbolic form of the alternative hypothesis must use one of these inequality symbols, either less than, greater than, or not equal to. Okay, less than, greater than, or not equal to. That belongs to the alternative hypothesis. Now for the null hypothesis is only the equal to because it says equal to some claimed value. However, some textbooks do use less than or equal to or greater than or equal to in the alternative hypothesis. But we only use equal to because statisticians and professional journals use the equal to only for their null hypothesis. Okay. So for this, we always use equal to for the null hypothesis. All right, now about forming your own claim or hypothesis, if you are con conducting a study and want to use a hypothesis test to support your claim, the claim must be worded so that it becomes the alternative hypothesis and can be expressed using only the symbols less than, greater than, or not equal to, okay? And as you can see here, this is just a flow chart from steps one, two, and three. And also on the next page are common phrases used in hypothesis testing that will help you figure out which inequality symbol to use, okay? So do be familiar with these six, okay? Because they will be helpful in helping you identify which one is less than or greater than or not equal to, which is a core shot. Um, alternative hypothesis. The one on the right uses the null hypothesis, but we only use 
be equal to. All right, now let's apply steps one, two, and three in example one. Here's the claim. A minority of adults would erase all of their personal information online if they could. A software firm survey of 466 randomly selected adults showed that 42% of them would erase all of their personal information online if they could. Here we're gonna complete parts A and B below. Part A is to express the original claim in symbolic form. Let the parameter represent the adults that would erase their personal information. And then part B, identify the null and the alternative hypothesis. So here's part A. And that is to identify the original claim. I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a tricky, this is going to be real tricky because it says here, a minority of adults, a minority of adults. Now, we can't use the 42% because that represents the sample of 400, 466 randomly selected adults. So in this case here, we have to think about this for a moment here. It is a percent, so we have to use lowercase p. A minority. Well, let's think of this. They're either going to erase the personal information or they don't. And the midpoint of that would be like half would do it, the other half won't. And if it's a minority of adults, that has to be this symbol, less than 0 0.5. Okay. So that's kind of a trick uh, question there for that particular problem here. So is P is less than 0.5 for a minority of adults. Now, if it was a majority of adults, then it would be P is greater than 0.5. So that's the answer to part A. Now, part B is to identify the null and alternative hypothesis. So I'm gonna do part B like this. Think of this as step number one. Step number two is finding the opposite of the original claim. And it's gonna be P, the opposite of less than. And it's a good thing that I have this here because the opposite of less than is gonna be this right here, greater than or equal to, okay? Is the opposite greater than or equal to 0 0.5? Okay, because if it's not less than, then it has to be greater than or equal to. That's the direct opposite. And now we can identify the null and alternative hypothesis. Now keep in mind the alternative hypothesis has either less than greater than or not equal to. So if you look at that, you have to decide which one of these will be the um, alternative hypothesis. Here is strictly less than, so that means that that statement has to be the alternative hypothesis. P is less than 0.5. And I'm gonna put the word claim in parentheses, because here, in this case, the alternative hypothesis is the claim. Now for the null hypothesis, it's gonna be P is the null always says the equal to no matter what. So BP is equal to 0 0.5. Okay. So that's how we identify the null and the alternative hypothesis in this case. Okay. Now, example two. The claim is the mean pulse rate in beats per minute of adult males is equal to 69.3 beats per minute. For a random sample of 150 males, the mean pulse rate is 70.8 beats per minute and the standard deviation is 11.2 beats per minute. Complete parts A and B below. Okay, so in part A, we want the original claim in symbolic form. 
Okay. Now we're dealing with the mean pulse rate. So we're not gonna be using P. The mean, we have to use this Greek letter mu. And it says is equal to, so that means we have to use the equal to symbol and then 69.3. Okay. So the original claim would be mu is equal to 69.3. And then part B, we need to find the null and alternative hypothesis, identify those. Okay, let's start by doing step number two, which is the opposite of the original claim. So the opposite of the original claim, well, in this case here, the opposite of equal to would be not equal to 69.3. Okay. And then the next step would be to go ahead and do the null and alternative hypothesis. So in this case here, we need to identify which one would be the null and which one would be the alternative hypothesis. Well, here that equal to belongs to the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis only has the equal to in it. So the mu is equal to 69.3 and the alternative has either the not equal to greater than or less than. So mu is not equal to 69.3. That's your alternative. And your original claim is the null hypothesis. So I'm gonna put the word claim in parentheses. Okay, and here's another example of identifying the null and alternative hypothesis. The claim is that the standard deviation of pulse rates of adult males is less than 11 beats per minute. For a random sample of 165 adult males, the pulse rates have a standard deviation of 9.6 beats per minute. Complete parts A and B below. So in part A, we're going to express this original claim in symbolic form. Now we're dealing with standard deviation, so we have to use the Greek letter sigma. And it says of adult males is less than, so we have to use the inequality symbol less than 11. And then part B, identify the null and alternative hypothesis. Here, let's identify the opposite of the original claim. If this is not less than, if this is less than, the opposite of less than will have to be greater than or equal to 11. So if it's not less than, it must be greater than or equal to. Okay, so now we can identify the null and alternative hypothesis. So I need to pick which one of these will be my alternative hypothesis. And it will have to be this one right here because it's strictly less than. So it'd be sigma is less than 11. Now the null hypothesis always has the equal to sign regardless. So this will be sigma is equal to 11. Okay. So that's how we identify the null and the alternative hypothesis using steps one, two, and three. Step one is the original claim. Step number two is identifying the opposite of the original claim. And then step number three is writing down your null and alternative hypothesis. Okay. Step number four in the procedure of hypothesis testing. You're going to select a significance level which is your alpha level. That is the probability of making the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. And these are your three common choices for alpha, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.10, with 0 0.05 being the most common. 
Now, in the problem, you will be told to use one of these three levels of significance to test the claim. So that will already be given to you. So you don't have to worry about selecting a uh, significance level. That will be provided for you in these examples. All right, now step number five is identifying the test statistic relevant to the test and determine its sampling distribution. Well, it's just the test statistic. But here in test number, in step five, you'll be, uh, you're gonna be calculating the test statistic, not only identifying it, you'll be calculating it right then and there. Now the ones we'll use is for proportion. I'll put asterisk there. And the other one is gonna be for the mean. Now these last two we will not worry about, okay? But here in this case here, the proportion is test statistic is gonna be Z is equal to P hat minus P all divided by the square root of P times Q divided by N. And then for mean, when sigma is not known, okay? When sigma is not known, we're gonna be using this T test statistic, which is T is equal to X bar minus mu divided by S over the square root of N. Now, when we get into these sections like section eight, two, when we test a claim about a proportion, now I'll write this off to this side, this is in section eight, two. And the one for a mean is section eight, three. We'll go into more detail on what these variables mean. Okay. All right, now on the next page. We'll be finding the test statistic that's in step number five, but then you're going to find either the p value or the critical value. Or critical values here. Here, the test statistic, of course, by definition, is a value used in making a decision about the null hypothesis. It is found by converting the sample statistics, such as a sample proportion, which is p hat, or the sample mean, which is x bar, or the sample standard deviation, which is s, to a score, such as a z, a t, or chi square, with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So you'll first transform the relevant sample statistic to a standard score or test statistic. Then find the p-value that can be used to make a decision about the null hypothesis or find the critical values that can be used in making a decision about the null hypothesis. Okay, now, those two test statistics I just showed you, we're gonna use these to help us uh, calculate the test statistic in these two examples here, like example four. Here we got the claim that fewer than 91% of adults have a cellular phone. In a re reputable poll of 1,051 adults, 84% said that they have a cell phone. Find the value of the test statistic, okay? Now I'm writing null and alternative hypothesis here. Fewer than 91% of adults have a cell phone. So if I was to write this in symbolic notation, this is a, about a proportion because 91%, that's a percent. So we're dealing with a proportion. So it's gonna be P is fewer than would be less than. 91% as a decimal will be 0.91. Now let's think about this. Should this belong to the null or alternative hypothesis? Well, it's less than, so P is less than 0.91 has to be the alternative hypothesis because the alternative hypothesis has either less than or greater than or not equal to. The null always has the equal to sign in it. So P is equal to 0.91. And we got a reputable poll of 1,051 students. So our N is 1,051. 
and 84% said they have a cell phone. That's gonna be P hat. As a decimal, 84% will be 0.84. And also, I need to know what Q is. Q is the complement of P. Q is always one minus P. So if this P is only one, then Q has to be one minus 0.91, which would be 0 0.09. Now the test statistic that we use for a proportion is this, Z is equal to P hat minus P divided by the square root of P times Q divided by N. And then we just substitute into that uh, test statistic formula here. Well, P hat is uh, 0.84 minus P, that's right here, 0.91 divided by the square root of P again is 0.91 times Q 0.09 and that's all divided by n, n is 1,051. Now let's enter all of this in our calculator. I'm gonna clear this out. And by the way, and if we're using the calculator, we need to put this numerator in parentheses. So in this case, we do left parentheses 0 0.84 minus 0 0.91, and then close parentheses. That's going to be divided by the square root is second and x squared on the calculator. And then type in 0 0.91 times 0 0.09 divided by 1,051. Okay. Since you're dealing with a Z, we're gonna round to two decimal places. So ne negative 7.9297 rounds to negative 7.93. All right. So that would be your test statistic for this sample. Okay, here's another example of calculating the test statistic. The mean pulse rate in beats per minute of adult males is equal to 69 beats per minute. For a random sample of 171 adults, the mean pulse rate is 69.3 beats per minute and the standard deviation is 10.7 beats per minute. Here we're gonna find the value of the test statistic. Okay, now here we're gonna be using a different test statistic because we're dealing with the mean. So here the mean pulse rate of adult males is equal to 69 beats per minute. So that's mu is equal to 69.3. And then we got a random sample of 171 adult males. So N, the sample size is 171. The mean pulse rate of the 171 adult males, that's the sample mean, X bar, 60, oh, I'm sorry, this should be 69, not 69.3. That would not look right. Yeah, is equal to 69 beats per minute. The 69.3, that's your sample mean. And the standard deviation, S, which is 10.7. And I wanna find the value of the test statistic. 
Here we're doing, dealing with the mean, so we need to look at the formula for the test statistic for a mean. And it's gonna be this one, t is equal to x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. And I'll write this out. t is equal to x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. And then we substitute. Our x bar is the 69.3 minus mu, that's 69, divided by s, that's 10.7, divided by the square root of n, which is 171. Now, if we use the calculator, we have to use left parentheses in the numerator, well, parentheses in the numerator in general, and parentheses in the denominator. So now, the numerator is left parentheses 69.3 minus 69, close parentheses, divided by, and then left parentheses in our denominator, 10.7 divided by, and then second, x squared for the square root, 171. Use your right arrow key to get out from underneath the radical, close your parentheses, and then hit enter. Let's say I want to round this off to two decimal places. This will be 0 That would be a test statistic for example five here for this sample data. And also make sure that you round up to whatever number of decimal places that the uh, homework asked for in my math lab. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the types of hypothesis tests that you'll have. You're going to have one of these three, either a two-tailed, a left-tailed, or a right-tailed test. Now, you can use the p-value or the critical value approach. Both require us to determine which, what type of test you're going to have. You could have a two-tailed test where the critical region is in two extremes or in the two tails. Okay, so as you can see here, the red represents the two tails right here. And it is divided equally, the alpha level is divided equally between the two tails of that critical region. You can see that it's divided equally. That's your critical region. That will help us determine whether we need to reject the null or fail to reject the null, as you can see. Then also you have a left, and by the way, notice where the null hypothesis has, has the equal sign. Alternative hypothesis has the not equal sign, so that tells you it's a two-tailed test. And then the left-tailed test is where the critical region is in the extreme left region, or the left tail. So here you just have the left tail shaded as your critical region. That would tell us to reject the null or fail to reject the null. And the null hypothesis again has the equal sign, but this time the alternative hypothesis has the less than sign. That means all of the alpha level is in the left tail. And then third is a right tail test. That's where the critical region is in the extreme right region or the right tail. So here that shaded area up to the right is the right tail that helps us either to reject the null or fail to reject the null. And by the way, as you can see, your null is still the equal to, the alternative is greater than. So that means it is a right tail test. You can see the inequality symbol in greater than points to the right. You're gonna have a right tail test. That means you shade the right tail, just like in the alternative, you have less than. Less than points to the left, that means 
you say you, the left you, you say the left tail. Okay, and the hint there is to determine whether a test is two tail, left tail, or right tail, always look at your alternative hypothesis and identify the region that supports the alternative hypothesis and conflicts with the null hypothesis, okay? So in other words, if your alternative is less than, it's a two-tailed test. You shade both tails. If your alternative says less than, that means it's a left-tailed test. You shade the left tail. Or if it's for right tail, if your alternative says greater than, that means you shade to the right. Okay. Now let's first talk about the p-value method and the critical value method. We'll start with the p-value method. The p-value or the probability value, and sometimes p-value is used with a lowercase p or an uppercase p. That is the probability of getting a value of the test statistic that is at least as extreme as the one corresponding, as the one representing the sample data, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Okay. There's a probability of getting a test, getting a value of the test statistic that is at least as extreme as the one representing the sample data, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And this is the procedure for that. If your critical region is a left tail, that means your p-value will be the area to the left of the test statistic. Or if the critical region is in the right tail, then your p-value will be the area to the right of the test statistic. Or if it's a two-tail test, that means the p-value will be twice the area in the tail beyond the test statistic. Okay. And here's a flow chart related to just that. Okay. We want to determine what type of test is either going to be left tail or right tail. If it's left, left tail, then your p-value will be the area to the left of the test statistic. Or if it's a right tail test, then your p-value will be the area to the right of the test statistic. But if it's two-tailed, then you need to ask yourself, is the test statistic to the right or to the left of center? If it's to the left of the center, then your p-value will be twice the area to the left of the test statistic. Or if it's to the right of center, that means your p-value will be twice the area to the right of the test statistic. Okay. All right, next is, uh, well, here's a word of caution. Do not confuse the p-value with the proportion. The p-value is the probability of a test statistic at least as extreme as the one obtained. Lowercase p is just your population proportion. Okay, so don't get those confused. All right, now the other method is the critical value method, sometimes called the traditional method. The critical value is the value that separates the critical region. That is when we reject the null hypothesis from the values of the test statistic that do not lead to rejection of the null hypothesis. Okay. Critical values depend on depend on the nature of the null hypothesis, the sampling distribution and the significance level alpha. Okay. And then we have the critical region or rejection region. That's gonna be the set of all values of the test statistic that causes us to reject the null hypothesis. So pretty much what I just showed you on the last page that red shading, that's called the critical region. That will help us determine whether we need to reject the null or fail to reject the null. So if a test statistic, test statistic lies within the critical region, you reject the null. If it doesn't, then you fail to reject 
the null hypothesis. And another illustration on that is on the next page right here. And the critical region is shaded in red. And that's your boundary line. That critical value will be that 1.645, for example. Okay. And when we do uh, use critical values, we can use this table here to help us out. These are just common critical Z values for hypothesis testing. The first column is for the level of significance in one tail, whether it's the left tail or the right tail, you'll look under this column, find your level of significance and then read to the right. And that would give you the critical value. And the one in the middle is for two tails. So if you have a two tail test, you'll look in this column, find your corresponding critical value. I mean, cut your level of significance in that column and then read to the right to get your critical value. Okay. We'll look at some of these shortly in a few of these examples. Okay. Step number seven is this. Once you have your critical value or your p-value, then you're going to make a decision of whether to reject the null or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, if you use the p-value method, you're going to compare that p-value with your level of significance or alpha. And the rule is this. If your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you will reject the null hypothesis. Or if the p-value is greater than alpha, then you will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, if you use the critical value method, you're going to compare the test statistic with the critical value based on what alpha is and the type of test you have, whether it's a two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed test, okay? You'll use that along with your alpha level to determine what your critical value is using this table that's up here at the top. Now, if the test statistic is in the critical region, reject the null hypothesis. Or if the test statistic is not in the critical region, if it's outside that critical region, you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. And then after that, we'll go to step number eight. And that is restating the decision using simple non-technical terms. Okay, so here you're going to state the final conclusion that addresses the original claim with wording that can be understood by those without knowledge of statistical procedures. So this is a table for wording the final conclusion. Either the claim will be the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. And then you're either going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So let's say, for example, the claim was the alternative hypothesis and you rejected the null hypothesis, then this is the statement that you'll start off with. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim. Okay. Or if the claim was the alternative hypothesis and you fail to reject the null hypothesis, then that means that there's not sufficient evidence to reject the claim. All right, now let's look at some examples of this. Here's example six. All right, the test statistic of Z is equal to 1.76 is obtained when testing a claim that P is greater than 0.5, that the proportion is greater than 0.5. In part A, you want to identify the hypothesis test as being two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. Then part B, find the uh, p-value. And then part C, using a significance level of alpha is equal to 0 0.10, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? All right, so let's start with part A. 
we want to know if it's a two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed test. Okay. So I'm going to write this as H sub zero, that's the null hypothesis, and H1 as the alternative hypothesis. It says P is greater than 0.5. I have to figure out whether it's going to be under the null or the alternative hypothesis. It's greater than, so that means it has to be an alternative hypothesis. So that goes here. And this is also the claim. The null hypothesis always has the equal to sign. So the P is equal to 0.5. And I always look at the alternative hypothesis to determine whether I have a left tail or right tail or two tail test. Notice that greater than points to the right. So that automatically tells me I have a right tail test. I have a right tail test. And now part B is finding the p-value. Sometimes it helps to draw the normal curve to see what's going on. A test statistic Z is 1.76, so that has to be to the right of zero. And if it's a right tail test, then that means our alpha level would be in the right tail. So I'm gonna shade the right tail. All right, in this case, we're gonna to have to use table A-2. Okay. And it is a positive uh, Z value. So we have to use the page that says positive Z scores and find 1.76. Uh, and this gives us a cumulative area from the left, which we don't want. We want the cumulative area from the right. That will help us out here. So find 1.7 on the, on the left and then 0.06 at the top row, read across and down. You'll see that it's gonna be 0 0.9608, 0 0.9608. So I'm gonna write over here area to the left Point nine six zero eight, which is this area here that we don't want. We want this shaded area here. That shaded area there represents the p-value. So the p-value, and since it's a right tail test, that means that the p-value is that area to the right of your test statistic. So we have to find that by doing one minus 0 0.9608. Since the area underneath the curve is one, so we have to do one minus that, which will be 0 0.39, 0 0.0392. 0 0.0392. Or to three decimal places if they ask for that 0 0.039. So again, in the homework, pay close attention to how many decimal places they ask for. So this is your p-value. That shaded area is your p-value. All right, now part C. Using a significance level of alpha is equal to 0 0.10, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? In this case here, our p-value rule is this. If the p-value is less than 0.5, 
or equal to our alpha level, you reject the null hypothesis. So here the p-value in this case was 0 0.039. Our level of significance is given as 0 0.10. I need to determine is 0 0.039 greater than, equal to, or less than 0 0.10. And in this case, 0 0.039 is less than 0 0.10. And it does satisfy the decision rule for hypothesis testing if we use the p-value method. So that means we reject the null hypothesis. Now, the other part is the uh, statement using simple non-technical terms. So. Let's go back up here. We rejected the null hypothesis and notice that the claim was the alternative hypothesis. We rejected the null, the claim was the alternative hypothesis. This statement right here is what we write down. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim. So here we say there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that P is greater than 0 0.5. So, that, so that's how we answer example five, I mean six. Okay. All right, here's another example of this, example seven. The test statistic of Z is equal to 1.55 is obtained when testing the claim that P is not equal to 0.436. Part A, we want to identify the hypothesis test as being two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. Find the p-value, which is part B. Part C, find using a significance level of, point, of alpha is equal to 0 0.10, should we reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis? OK. So let's start with part A. And I'm going to write null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. That P is not equal to 0.436. I need, to, I need to determine if that's going to be the null or alternative hypothesis. Keep in mind the alternative hypothesis has either greater than, less than, or not equal to, has not equal to. So that's my alternative hypothesis. And a null always has the equal sign in it. So just be P is equal to 0.436. And the claim that P is equal to 0.4, not equal to 0.436, that's my alternative hypothesis. I'm gonna put the word claim here. And look at your alternative hypothesis. It says not equal to. That tells me I have a two tailed test. I have a two-tailed test. Keep in mind the alternative hypothesis tells you what type of test you have, either a one tail, a left tail, a right tail, or a two-tailed test. Now part B is finding the p-value. And sometimes it does help to draw the normal curve. And my test statistic Z is 
Okay. And since it's a two-tailed test, I know that my p-value has to be two times. The area beyond this test statistic has to be two times. And the reason for that is it says it is a two-tailed test. Let's see, now I need the area to the left. of this using table A-2. So here, bring up the uh, table A-2 with positive z-scores. I'm gonna find 1.5 and then 0.05. If I go across and down, that would be 0 0.9394. Okay. Now that 0 0.9394 is this area to the left. That I don't want. I want this area here. Okay. Now since my since I have a two-tailed test, the p-value must be equal to two times the area beyond this test statistic right here, which I need to find out by doing one minus 0 0.9394. So when I do two times, 0.9394 subtracted from one would be 0 0.06. Zero six, and then two times 0 0.0606 0 6 will be 0 0.1212, or to three decimal places, 0 0.121. That's the p-value. And the way you find that p-value when you have a two-tailed test, you have to do two times the area beyond the test statistic. And now part C, using a significance level of alpha is equal to 0 0.10, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? In this case, that rule is this, if our p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you want to reject the null hypothesis. Here your p-value is 0.121. Your alpha level was given as 0 0.10. When we compare those two, 0.121 is greater than 0 0.10. Okay, so that violates that rule. So that means we need to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and if I go back to that table here, the claim was the alternative hypothesis. We fail to reject the null hypothesis, so that means that there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. So we start off by saying that there is not. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that P does not equal to 0 0.436. Okay. All right, now let's take a look at example eight. Well, it says here the test statistic of Z is 
equal to negative 3.14 is obtained when testing the claim that, that P is less than 0.88. So here we got uh, this. Using a significance level of alpha is equal to 0.01, find the critical value. Now we're not looking for the P value, we're looking for the critical value or critical values if necessary. Part B, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Okay. All right, let's start off by doing this, identifying our null and alternative hypothesis. P is less than 0.88. Well, it says less than, so it has to be an alternative hypothesis. Has to be. The null always has the equal sign. So it'd be P is equal to 0.88. And that null hypothesis is the claim because the claim does say that P is less than 0.88. Well, if it's less than, that means I have a left-tailed test. A left-tailed test. And I'm also going to draw a normal curve for this. Okay. All right, so now I know this, my alpha level is 0 0.01, and I have a left tail test. I'm going to bring up that table for common critical values, which is this. So by looking at this, I have a left tail test. So I look under the column for level of significance in one tail, whether it's left tail or right tail, it's a one tail test. I look for alpha is equal to 0 0.01. And that's under the column for level of significance in one tail. Read to the right, this will be your critical value, 2.33. Now, since it is a left tail test, 2.33 will not be positive. It will have to be a negative. 2.33, okay? So with critical values here, if you're using this table that I gave you here, if you have a left tail test, that means your critical value will be negative. If it's a right tail test, then your critical value will be positive. For a two tail test, you'll have a positive and a negative critical values. Both of your critical values would be positive and negative if you have a two-tailed test. Since I have a left-tailed test, the critical value has to be negative. So my critical value and that's, of course, Z of alpha over 2 would be negative 2.33. All right, so that's part A. Now part B, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Okay, so I did part A, now part B. 2.33. So we're gonna be dealing with this critical region right here to the left of that. And that decision rule is this, yeah. Let's say Z is less than your critical value of negative 2.33, reject the null hypothesis. 
when you use the critical value approach, if your tested statistic falls within that uh, critical region, you reject the null hypothesis. So here that Z was negative 3.14. And if you compare that to negative 2.33, it is less than the critical value of negative 2.33. Okay, and I will show you where negative 3.14 is. That has to be to the left of negative 2.33. So here's negative 3.14, and that's to the left of your critical value. So it is in that critical region. So we can reject the null hypothesis. Okay, now going back to that table, we rejected the null hypothesis, but our alternative hypothesis is the claim. The claim was the alternative hypothesis. We rejected the null. That means that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim. So we can say here that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that a proportion is less than 0.88. Okay. Okay, now let's look at example nine. The tested statistic of Z is negative 2.75 is obtained when testing the claim that P is less than, P is equal to three fifths. And in part A, you're going to use a significance level of alpha is equal to 0.05 to find the critical value. And in part B, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Okay, so in this case here, let's write our null and alternative hypothesis. Equal to means it belongs to the null hypothesis. P is equal to three fifths. The alternative, the opposite of equal to would have to be not equal to three fifths. And by the way, the claim would be the uh, null hypothesis this time, because it does say the claim that P is equal to three fifths. Now, if I look at the alternative, it says not equal to. That tells me I have a two-tailed test. And this will help me find the critical value. Okay, alpha level is uh, 0 0.05 and it's in two tails. Okay, so going back to that chart that I have for my common critical Z values here. I'm gonna look under the column that says level of significance in two tails, since this is a two tail test. Uh, 0.05 is my level of significance, that's right here. To the right of that is the critical value, 1.96. But it is a two-tailed test, so that means I have two critical values here. One is negative 1.96, the other one is a positive 
So here I've got two critical regions here. And if that test statistics falls in either one of these two critical regions, I can reject the null hypothesis, okay? So to answer part A, I have two critical values. I got negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. I have two of them since I have a two-tailed test. So one's negative, the other one's gonna be positive. Now part B is this, should we reject the null hypothesis or should we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Well, the decision rule will be this. If my Z is, and I'm gonna say less than, if Z, the, the uh, test statistic for Z is less than, since it's shaded to the left, negative 1.96, or Z is greater than, since it's shaded to the right, positive 1.96, reject the null hypothesis. Now my test statistic is negative 2.75. Well, compare that to the negative 1.96 it is certainly less than negative 1.96. Because if we look at this uh, normal curve, negative 2.75 will be to the left of negative 1.56. So it definitely lands in the critical region. So here's negative 2.75 over here somewhere. So that means I can reject the null hypothesis. Reject the null hypothesis. I'm going back to table, the other table. Notice that the claim was the null hypothesis. I rejected the null hypothesis. The claim is the null, and I rejected the null. That means that there is sufficient evidence to reject the claim, or there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim. So I write this out. There is sufficient evidence to and I'll go ahead and write this out, warrant rejection of the claim. That P equals three fifths. Okay, and now let's look at example 10. We're assuming a significance level of alpha is equal to 0 0.201 and use the given information to complete parts A and B below. The original claim is this, the mean pulse rates in beats per minute of a certain group of adult males is 68 beats per minute. The hypothesis test results in a p-value of 0 0.0023. Part A is this. We want to state the conclusion about the null hypothesis, either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then part B is without using technical terms, state the final conclusion that addresses the original claim. Okay, so let's first write our null in alternative hypothesis. So said the mean pulse rates of a certain group of adult males is 68 beats per minute. Well, we're dealing with the mean, so we have to use the Greek letter mu. And the word is, is the equal to, and then 68. 
that would have to be the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis always has the equal to. Now for the alternative hypothesis, the opposite of the equal to would have to be not equal to. Okay. And that original claim is your null hypothesis because it says the mean pulse rates of a certain group of adult males is 68 beats per minute. That's your claim, which is your null hypothesis. Now we're told that the p-value was uh, 0 0.0023. So we're comparing the p-value with our alpha level of 0 0.01. We're assuming the significance level of alpha equal 0 0.01. And the rule states, if your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you want to reject the null hypothesis. Compare the p-value of 0 0.0023 with that alpha level of 0 0.01. You'll see that it is less than, your p-value is less than alpha. And if the p-value is less than alpha, that means we can reject the null hypothesis. So we reject the null hypothesis. And now part B. Without using technical terms, state the final conclusion that addressed the original claim. Well, the claim was our null hypothesis. We rejected the null hypothesis. So let's go back to this. The claim was the null hypothesis. We rejected the null hypothesis. That means that there is sufficient evidence to, we'll say, warrant rejection of the claim. So that means that there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that, and in this case, the mean pulse rate, the mean pulse rate of the group of the group of adult men, males, of adult males is 68 feet per minute, okay? Okay. So those are the bits and pieces of the eight step procedure for hypothesis testing, okay? Now, let's talk about accept versus fail to reject. Now the term accept is misleading because it implies incorrectly that the null hypothesis has been proved, but we can never prove a null hypothesis. So we use the phrase, fail to reject. It says more correctly that the available evidence is not strong enough to warrant rejection of the null hypothesis. So think of this as being, an, being in a court when a person is being tried for a crime. When the verdict is handed out, they usually say guilty or not guilty. Guilty meaning that they do have evidence to support the fact that you, that this person committed the crime, not guilty. It doesn't mean they didn't do the crime. They probably did, but they, you know, the prosecution didn't have the sufficient evidence to say that he committed that crime. Okay. 
and never conclude a hypothesis test with a statement of saying, reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. You wanna make sense of the conclusion with a statement that uses simple non-technical wording that addresses the original claim. So step number eight in the hypothesis testing procedure is very important. You wanna uh, state that conclusion or word the final conclusion. Okay, last thing in this video that we'll talk about is this. Errors in hypothesis testing, okay? We arrive at the conclusion of rejecting it or failing to reject it when we test the null hypothesis. Such conclusions are sometimes correct and sometimes wrong if we apply, even if we apply all the procedures correctly. We distinguish, we distinguish between the two types of errors by calling them type one and type two errors. Now, type one error by definition is the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. And the symbol alpha is used to represent the probability of a type one error. Type two error is the mistake of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false. And we use the symbol beta to represent the probability of a type one error. I mean, a type two error, okay? And you know that alpha level, if you recall by definition, it is the probability of making the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis, even when it is true. That's the same as the type one error. Okay. And here's a chart that is based on type one and type two errors here. The decision is reject the null or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is either going to be true or false. If we reject the null hypothesis and we find out that it is true, then we committed a type one error. If we reject the null hypothesis and it is false, that null hypothesis is false, we made the correct decision. Let's say we fail to reject the null hypothesis and it is true. I mean, the null hypothesis is true. We fail to reject it. Correct decision. But if the null hypothesis is false and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then we committed a type two error. So think of this as being on trial for a crime the null hypothesis is going to be you didn't commit the crime, you're guilty. The alternative could be that you are not guilty. So sometimes criminal cases are like that, whether you commit a type one error or a type two error. Now, here's an example of just that. Here I want to identify the type one error and the type two error that corresponds to the given hypothesis. That the proportion of people who write with their left hand is equal to 0.24. All right, let's write our null and alternative hypothesis. Let's see, equal to has to be in the null hypothesis. So that means P is equal to 0.24. The opposite of equal to is not equal to. So that has to be in the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So let's think about this. If we reject this null hypothesis, and it is true, then it's a type one error. So here we're rejecting the, uh, proportion, the fact that the portion of people who write with their left hand is equal to 0.24, and it is actually that amount, then that means we would, we've uh, committed a type one error. We're rejecting this, and we find out that it is actually true. So here's the way we write the type one error. 
type one error is this. You're rejecting the claim that the proportion of people who write left-handed is 0 0.24 when the proportion is actually 0.24. Okay, that's a type one error. We're rejecting this claim, which is right, but this no hypothesis is, it is the claim, we rejected the claim that the proportion of people who write left-handed is 0.24, when it is actually 0.24. Now for a type two error. In a type two error, you're failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false. That means if I keep this, I mean, not keep it, if I fail to reject this and it is actually false, which will mean that the alternative hypothesis has to be true. Okay. So here's what the type two error is in word form. Failing to reject the claim that the proportion of people who write left-handed is 0 0.24 when the proportion is actually different. So if, it's, if it's not equal to, then it means it's just saying that it's actually different from 0 0.24. So that's how we identify the type one and the type two error corresponding to that, to this claim right here. Okay. All right, now at the bottom of your handout is the hypothesis testing procedure, all eight steps here. This is just a summarize, summary of all of this. Okay, in step number one, you write the original claim in symbolic form. Number two, state the opposite of the original claim in symbolic form. Step number three, you're gonna use the first two steps to identify the null and alternative hypotheses. Keep in mind that the null always uses the equal sign. The alternative hypothesis always uses less than, greater than, or not equal to. Then state your level of significance that's pretty much given to you. Step number five is to calculate the test statistic. Whether you're testing a claim about a proportion, which we'll talk about in the next video, or testing a claim about the population mean, which we'll talk about in the video after that. And then step number six, use either the p-value method or the traditional method. With the p-value method, you find your p-value using a calculator or table A-2 or A-3 and then compare your p-value with your level of significance. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. Or if the p-value is greater than alpha, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then 
we use the traditional method or the critical value method. You'll have to draw a normal curve and locate the area of the level of significance, which is your alpha level, and then use that level of significance, which is your alpha, to find your critical value. You'll compare that critical value with your test statistic. If your test statistic falls within that critical region, you reject the null hypothesis. Or if the test statistic is outside the critical region, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then step number seven, you'll use that to state whether to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then finally, you'll state your conclusion using simple non-technical terms to address the original claim, okay? So pretty much we'll be using this in uh, section 8.2, which is testing a claim about a proportion and section 8.3, testing a claim about a mean. All right, so that will conclude this video on section 8.1, dealing with the basics of hypothesis testing. Uh, do feel free to email me if you have any questions about any of the problems in this video or any of the homework problems in my math lab.